the single most important molecule in biophysics is this one, water. This is actually a computer simulation of water. Uh, and once in the 1970s, this was science fiction, the type of simulation that got people the Nobel Prize. Uh, today, this is something you can pretty much do on a laptop. So this is liquid water. Uh, and you've probably seen ice crystals or something. And liquid water behaves quite differently. In ice crystals, every water molecule participates in four hydrogen bonds. It donates two hydrogen bonds, and it accepts two. So that means that you have two full hydrogen bonds per water molecule. And in liquid water, you have almost the same number, 1.7. So it's not as simple as saying when you're moving, when you're melting ice, you're breaking all the hydrogen bonds. But on the other, we're not really breaking any real bonds either. There is not a single oxygen that's leaving the hydrogens. So this is all a matter of what state is most favorable. Is it most favorable to be in crystal or more favorable to liquid? How are all these molecules interacting? In particular, as you're moving between different states here, this is the finite temperature that causes them to move semi-randomly. And these are things we need to understand. In particular, if you put at this at, say, 300 Kelvin, which phase is more favorable for water? It's going to turn out that's not too different from proteins or DNA or anything. So that understanding that if you're studying physics, in particular quantum physics or quantum chemistry, it's usually you're looking at one molecule, right? And then you want to determine what is the structure with the capital S, what is the energy? This is more complicated. I haven't even introduced any quantum yet. But the problem is that we can be in multiple structures, which, again, is very much a character of biology. We're going to come back to that a lot. Uh, it turns out that these hydrogen bonds are very much uh, causing the properties of water, that you have high freezing temperature, high boiling point. Uh, the energy of each hydrogen bond in water is roughly 2 kilocalories per mole. Uh, can be slightly more in proteins. That's a number you should know, but we're going to come back and repeat it several times. And the reason why you have this in water, you might remember even from upper secondary school, is that the oxygen will effectively steal some electrons from the hydrogens, so that the hydrogens end up with a small partial charge, positive charge, and the oxygen with a small negative charge. And that means that that hydrogen is also happy to interact a bit with that oxygen. There is another molecule that's equally central, uh, and that brings us more into the real biomolecular structure. That's DNA. Um, You've probably seen this, well, I would be a bit worried if you haven't seen that molecule a dozen or a hundred times by now. Uh, you see it all over popular science literature and everything. It's kind of the hallmark of modern science. Uh, it can, I think, yes, oh hi, it's even embroidered into carpets. Uh, virtually every single life science center in the world, including SciLife Lab, needs to have a model of DNA in their logotype. Um, that tells you something about how important it is. Arguably, although I'm somewhat biased, uh, arguably this is the structure of DNA could be considered the most important scientific discovery of the 20th century. At least if you have a bias towards biophysics. Um, but that's, that was not at all obvious when people determined the structure. Do you know what this is? Mm, uh, in a way, it's not so bad. Um, so chromosomes, the problem is science. Science always makes sense retroactively. When we knew what we were finding, right? But when you make science, you usually start out with a mess and then try to make sense of it. Uh, so DNA was actually first isolated in the late 1800s. Somebody tried to find other than they were studying pus from infection uh, wounds and everything. And then they came up with some sort of other strange compound. Uh, and at the time, they had no idea what this was. Uh, but eventually, in the first part of the 19th century, people were able to isolate this strange molecule that exists in all cells. And when you, when you isolate the molecule, again, at the time, there were no obvious easy ways to determine what the molecule looks like. It's a salt or something. Uh, you can easily dry it out to get it into a salt. But what do you do from that? It's a salt. Uh, you can't put a salt in a microscope and see what it looks like, because the microscope is limited by the wavelength of light. The obvious way you could do with physics is, of course, if you turn the salt, if the salt is a proper crystal, you could shoot x-rays on it. And if it's now a sequence of crystals, then you have trillions and trillions of molecules, right? And then you're going to get a diffraction pattern from all these molecules. And then you can capture this diffraction pattern. Now, that is trivial for sodium chloride, two atoms. And you determine what is the relative, what is the length between two sodium atoms, what is the length between two chloride atoms, and what is the length between sodium and chloride. And from the patterns, you can see the type of unit cell you have in it. Easy. For DNA, in principle, the same thing works. But it's a slightly more complicated molecule. 
So getting, so this is a diffraction pattern from a DNA crystal determined by a scientist who is not as famous as she should be, Rosalind Franklin. This photo, what the scribble there says, it's photo 52 on May 2nd, 1952. And that's all they had. What Rosalind and Franklin Gosling did is that there's an amazing amount of thing you can do just by approaching this systematically. So do you see that there appears to be some sort of systematic difference between these bars, right? They're spaced roughly the same distance apart. And if you do your physics properly, and you're just going to have to trust me here, I would so not know this either. Uh, if you start to put out some length lines here, you can actually use those length lines to derive, well first, this cross would correspond to that you're actually having some sort of helical shape in the structure. And these length lines will tell you something about the length scale, that there is some sort of repeat here with a few angstroms or nanometer. But that's all you can determine because it's pretty darn low resolution. So you can't go from the left and tell what the structure is. That's impossible. What you then can do is that you can sit down pretty much with a molecular model and say, hmm, if I have a hypothesis how DNA would look like, I can test, would this hypothesis model lead to a diffraction pattern that would look like the one on the left? Then there are, two pos there are three possible answers. The answer might be, no, actually, in principle, there are only two. Your model could be incompatible with the data, or your model can be compatible with the data. It's impossible to say that the data proves that your model is right. And a lot of very famous people did this. What you have here on the right is a model by Linus Pauling, arguably the most, one of the most famous scientists of the 20th century. So this is a helical model uh, that uses the base of DNA because we knew from a chemical composition, people knew what the basis in DNA looked like. It's just that we didn't know what the entire structure looked like. So this is a structure that looks like a spiral stair in the middle uh, with the backbone in the middle, and then you have the basis pointing out. This was published in Nature. 1952, I think. <laughs> it's a completely incorrect structure, right? And like 50 years later, we can laugh at it. But that structure is compatible with the data. It's impossible. The data can't rule out that structure. So this is as beautiful as physics is with great models. Physics can also lead you wrong. It's not a stupid structure. It's one of, again, one of the most world famous chemists and physicists in the world. But the structure was not right. We tend to sweep such things under the rug in the history of science, and I think that's really stupid. Because when we present science to you as students, we send the signal that every single prediction we ever made was right. And that's not the case, it's rather the opposite. 95% of the predictions we make are wrong. Uh, we're going to come back to after the break how we figured out that it was right. But there's a, very, there's a famous interview with Linus Pauling, not specifically based on that paper. Um, that's 30 years later when it was famous uh, with his Nobel Prize and everything. And there is this interviewer, Dave, I forgot what his name was. And I was, so Dr. Pauling, how does it come that you have so many great ideas? And his answer is, well, Dave, it starts with having a lot of ideas. <laughs> and the point is that is how science works. You need to have lots of ideas. You need to dare to make assumptions. And that's one of the things I want to teach you in this course. We want to, don't be afraid of picking up pen and paper and start assuming things. Work on things and see where it leads. The worst thing that can happen is that you realize you get a beautiful model and two pages later you're going to realize, oh shit, that model is completely compatible with the data. But that we're going to come back to after the break. It's 2 p.m. So let's meet here a quarter past and then I will continue. All right, I will get started again. Uh, so I'm going to tell what I told Burke and Lucy here in the break that I know that you like structure a lot. So what I'm going to do for all of these lectures I will try hard to stop sharply on time and not putting over more than one minute. That might mean that some lectures I'm going to run out of time and then I just move the last five or ten slides or whatever to the next lecture. And so I'm never going to skip going through them. If we want to understand the DNA structure a bit, and this is something that I would like to ask you to do because it's hard to understand in 60 seconds. Understand the different components of these nucleotides. Uh, you have the different bases that you've probably seen in popular science at least, A, G, C, and T that then they're binding to a small sugar, which is also binding to a phosphate, and then these phosphates are linked into this long chain that was determined by Levin already in the early 1900s. Uh, there are a bunch of different ways you can look at the structure, but the whole point, the whole component here, each building block is called a nucleotide with T. Uh, and then you can have a number of phosphates there. You have the bases, which are the actual parts connecting to each other, 
and I unfortunately this was the only one I printed in your handout notes but I think this might be a better picture and you can find this online so that the whole thing is called a nucleotide with T and that consists of a phosphates a sugar and the sugar and the base together there is called the nucleoside which is a nitrogenous base um, classical exam question to ask you to show I will show you the molecule and I will ask you to name what the different components are these have been known for a long time since the early 1900s um, and during a lot of years when people spent time studying that Erwin Schagaff found very interesting results that it appears that, that no matter what organism you have you have different ratios of all these heads. but it appears that adenine and thymine always occur at roughly the same concentration and guanine and cytosine roughly at the same concentration what that concentration is it varies but they always occur in pairs and that was the one key discovery that two other scientists used so there are a number of problems with the structure even without the Shagaf rules that these outwards facing bases they would need to mark hydrogen bonds with water or something on the side yes It's biology, noisy. And you see, this is the problem for US physicists. Because you expect to see this number with 14 decimals, right? 26.0 and 23.9, is that the same, Lucy? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's how a biophysicist thinks. <laughs> because it's 5%, just a 5% measurement error? That's awesome. <laughs> <laughs> to be honest, there should be an error it should be. Uh, but again, in biophysics, plus, there should be plus minuses everywhere. So this, this is due more to measurement errors yeah. rather than uh, diseases. But the, yes, but also there are so many things where you might have ended up with a bit of RNA in the sample, right? There, there are 110 things that could have gone wrong here. So that the key thing about focus on the first principle, the simplest possible explanation. But then the point here is to compare it to 19 versus 30. That starts to be a significant difference. So the patterns. The problem with this structure is that you would have electrostatic charges. There, those phosphates are negatively charged. So you're going to take lots of negative charges and put them right next to each other. That's going to be bad. Uh, there are going to be some steric clashes that is atoms will bump into each other if you try to build a model of this. So that it was not wrong, but it's not obvious that uh, this model would be so great. And at this point, there were two other scientists that stepped in. And depending on this way you tell the story, you could argue that they pretty much stole Rosalind Franklin's discovery. There is probably some truth in that, because I don't think that they were entirely scientific honest about it. But I would also say the key difference is that they took somebody's data, but they spent more time thinking about it. And they came up with one amazing discovery. And there is a reason. I'm going to pass around this paper to you. Uh, I would suggest that you read this until tomorrow. It's a long paper, two pages in Nature in 1953. Uh, they came up with the reason why these must occur in pairs is that they must bond to each other. And suddenly you have an obvious explanation for the char gap rules. And then they started to build these molecular models you see there on the left, and it fit the structural data completely. And you see this point is that this explains the char gap rules. There was no obvious reason in the Linus Pauling model why we would have the char gap rules. And there's a beautiful formulation towards the end of this paper that you should remember. Uh, and then basically, it has not escaped, I don't, I don't remember the exact word, but it has not escaped our attention that the proposed mechanism would also provide a mechanism for inheritance. Period. That's it. So that's basically, they're arguing, this is how they're, this is the genetic material of mankind. And that sentence, again, is indicative of the largest discovery in the 20th century. Uh, this structure also ends up being heavily stabilized by hydrogen bonds. It's the hydrogen bonds that's tying these pairs of bases together. Uh, and the hydrogen bonds, again, provides the molecular basis of this Shargaff's ratio, his rules. Um, there are a ton of other stabilization features. If you look at that structure, you even have so-called pi-pi stacking. I'm not sure if you've seen that in a biophysical chemistry course or something. But you have, have aromatic rings, and these aromatic rings on the bases will interact with each other in very favorable ways when they're stacked this way. So DNA is a surprisingly stable molecule. Uh, it's also a slightly more complex molecule. Why would you have four bases? Being a physicist, you probably work with computers. How many states do you have in computers? Two, binary. So why would you have four? That's more complicated. 
So if you only had two bases, and let's say that you have eight positions, in eight positions you can encode 256 different states. If you have four bases in eight positions, we can record 65,536 different states. So it becomes a more compact storage when you allow slightly more different levels. This is incidentally what you use in modern flash storage too. You have more than two levels, you have multi-level storage. So it's a very efficient way of storing information in molecular structures. Um, and there's a ton of information in DNA that we won't have time to go into. Um, this is then, of course, long after uh, the initial discovery, we've now been able to sequence whole genomes. Um, and on the top, you have an amoeba and the bottom, mankind. There's a huge variation diversity here in how large the genomes are. So a small genome could be just a few thousand uh, base pairs. There are bacteria that are in the ballpark of 10,000 base, five or 10,000 base pairs. Uh, or at least 100,000. Uh, mankind, how large are your genomes? That's a number you should know. Three billion base pairs. Again, plus minus 10%. <laughs> Three billion base pairs. How many proteins does that correspond to? Because each such gene well, the genome will encode for proteins, right? So how many proteins do you have in your bodies? Well, we did for a long time, we didn't know. We were guessing. Um, we were guessing a lot. Um, so when these first structural, and it, it's also, do you think that, if you look, sorry, if you look at the previous slide, mankind certainly isn't the most advanced structure here. There are certainly some plants and everything that have 100 million. Yes. Um, as we were able to sequence the entire human genome, the sequencing was just the first step. The second step that I'm going over 20 years now is trying to make sense out of these sequences. What proteins do they code for? Uh, there are some deep questions is that most of the protein in your cells doesn't code for, for anything at all. At least it doesn't appear to code for anything. So like 90% of, of your DNA is kind of strange dark DNA that is important, but it doesn't appear to code for proteins directly. And that has been one of the long debates here is that originally it was thought that just 1% of your genome coded for proteins. Today it might be 5 or 10%. I think, yes, we have a later paper on this where we would argue that it's 8.2% coding for related to function at least. But something like 90% is just strange DNA. It's not useless. Uh, all organisms don't have this. In a bacterium, virtually 95% of the DNA will code for proteins. So we are different than bacteria here. And the general consensus today is that most of this DNA is regulatory. So you have pieces of DNA that can kind of shut off RNA. So that the DNA can control whether a protein should be expressed when you're young or when you're old. Um, there is a classical example of fetal hemoglobin uh, that has higher affinity to oxygen because the, the fetus need to be able to steal oxygen from the mother. Now the second we are born, we no longer need that fetal hemoglobin. And then we shut off the gene. A bacterium can't do that, but a human can do. Uh, but this is not quite science fiction, but very much active research. So it's a bit of a mess. Uh, to come back to the question of how many proteins we have, that has been going down year by year. We thought at first it was 50,000 to 100,000. The latest number pegs at the slightly below 20,000. So as fancy as you think you are, you are not as particularly fancy. There are only 20,000 small molecules that determine everything about us from the color of our eyes to the hair to their length, everything. If you compare it to something else, a Christmas tree given the season, how many proteins does a Christmas tree have? Take a wild guess. 15,000. Good guess, but wrong. 200,000. So you're, we are roughly one-tenth as complex as a Christmas tree. So we don't really know why. Uh, it likely has to do with evolutionary pressure. There's, well, I guess if you're a Christmas tree, it's not good to be beautiful. Uh, <laughs> but uh, the, the most extreme evolutionary pressure is bacteria. And that's likely why bacteria has had to focus on so few, maybe just four or 5,000 proteins, because they can't afford to carry around things that are not absolutely necessary. But all this evolutionary stuff, we don't know. We're going to come back to that, the evolutionary pressure on biology and everything. There is another type of molecule called RNA, just to remember what DNA looked like. If you take that sugar, and in DNA, we have an OH and an H group. In RNA, you have two OH groups. That's a tiny difference. 
but this will completely alter its stability and how it behaves. So while DNA forms a double helix with this classical, RNA is typically prefers to be a single strand. Uh, I'm not going to go into details exactly about how these reactions work. Um, RNA, this AGCT basis we have in, R in DNA, they're AGC and uracil instead of thymine in RNA. Um, there is a molecular reason that I'll, I'll cover it in 30 seconds. And it has to do with that cytosine can actually chemically be degraded to uracil. Cytosine exists in both. It takes a while. If that were to happen in, if you had uracil all over the place in, uh, sorry, uh, in RNA, the problem is this would lead to errors all the time that would build up and that would be very bad. So in DNA, that where we store information a long time, it's very important that they are different. In RNA, we typically just store information transitionary, so it doesn't really matter that much. And that's likely the evolutionary reason. It also means that RNA is not really stable. RNA will break down. You can't, uh, if you work with RNA in the lab, you typically keep it on ice to make sure that it doesn't break down. What you get from these Neanderthal genomes and everything, that's always DNA. Uh, and there is a small famous story there that my uncle, uh, he spent in the 1960s, there were a lot of research going on to understanding how RNA breaks down and everything. Uh, and there were lots of labs in the world that he was sitting in Princeton working with. And after a while, I think he got bored that the entire rest of the lab were working with RNA. And that's somebody said, well, can't I study DNA? And everything, but that's really stupid. Everybody knows that DNA is stable. So he started studying DNA and actually found out DNA is not necessarily stable. DNA breaks down too. And that's what got him the Nobel Prize in Sweden a few years ago. Um, and this is the reason for a whole lot of cancers and everything. DNA too is degraded by, by orders of magnitude slower than RNA. It's Thomas Lindahl. I think we covered the structures already. Uh, you've seen the DNA. The RNA, we could plot it that way. Do you think that molecule would be stable? It would never look that way. So what RNA will do is that RNA will coil up. It's self-complementary that this single chain will coil up into some sort of complex structures. Uh, and these are much floppier than DNA and they exist in many more conformations. There are a bunch of different places where RNA occurs. Um, we certainly have, if you look in the ribosome, which is kind of the cellular, the protein factory in the cell, that's actually a mix of protein and RNA. Uh, so that the ribosomal RNA is the dark blue parts here. Uh, and uh, no, sorry, the dark blue is a small subunit and the dark red is the large subunit. And I don't think we separate, no. It's slightly darker versus uh, brighter shades that separates the DNA versus the protein part, but it's not that good. Uh, so the lighter colors here should be the protein while the darker ones should be RNA. So this is a semi horrible mix of RNA and protein. You don't even see the atoms here because it's so large. There is transfer RNA that is used when we're moving the small building blocks that's going to help us to build the proteins. Um, again, I'm going to come back to that in a second. And at some point now we're starting to have a lot of different molecules. And the place where all of these molecules are used is when we build proteins. And I figure that's, in particular, this is most of you are physicists. You might have seen this in upper secondary school, but you've probably forgotten most of it. So I'm going to take a couple of minutes here and well, repeat roughly how proteins are created and how genetic material works, but introduce it in a slightly different way. This is something called the central dogma of molecular biology. The, the two books we have here, actually I can pass around the books if you want to have a look at, uh, read them and see if either if you like either better. Both of them introduce this, but they introduce it in slightly different ways. So the central dogma of molecular biology can be formulated as sequence leads to structure leads to function. And the sequence we have, that is what you have encoded in your genome, in the DNA. That's pure sequence information. Well, it is encoded by molecules, but it's sequence, it's A, G, C, and T. This is converted through RNA to protein structure. And for a particular sequence of DNA, you will have a particular sequence of amino acids in a protein. And that will determine whether this is an antibody or an ion channel or hemoglobin or something else. Given a particular structure, that will give it a particular function. For instance, hemoglobin carries oxygen. Uh, an antibody, well, that acts as an antibody. And a pump will maybe move ions across the, uh, the membrane. But it's always sequence, DNA leads to structure, the protein leads to the function, what the protein does. If you want to change the function, 
we need to change the structure, and if you want to change the structure, that means we have to change the sequence, the sequence structure function. And the way this happens is that we need to start from DNA. Um, and DNA is normally, when, when you see DNA, it always has this double helix one. But if it's a double helix, we kind of protect the basis on the inside, right? So to be able to read this, you need to start by splitting the DNA. And this whole sequence of events where you need to recognize the part of the DNA, a particular combination of bases, where to start reading. Then we need to cut the DNA open. And we're going to need a small machine to do this. And remember what I said the first part of last lecture. If you need a small machine to do something, what would your first guess be? It's a protein. So we need some sort of protein doing this. Uh, this protein, of course, is also encoded for in DNA. So then we have a bit of a chicken and an egg problem, but let's not worry about that for now. So this is a protein called POLD or DNA polymerase. So this cuts, cuts up DNA, and it can then create copies of DNA. So yeah, then I have two strands. So first you're opening here, and now you have one DNA strand there and one DNA strand there. And that's how we can replicate the information. The other alternative is that, well, that's good if you want to create more DNA, but then we would live in a DNA world that we have more and more DNA. It's not useful unless we can somehow read it and move the information somewhere else. That we do with a slightly different protein. Um, it's a process called transcription, transcribe, read something, right? Uh, so then we need to open the DNA in a small piece. And this is a molecule called RNA polymerase. So the polymerization process here is when we're stitching things together. That's why they're both called polymerases. And ACE is always an enzyme, a molecule helping you to do a process. But in this case, we're not copying it to DNA strand. In this case, we're leaving the DNA as is because the DNA will close again, rewinding, but we're creating an RNA copy of the molecule. This is actually, it's not just a single protein. It's an entire class of proteins that are related to each other. Uh, they were, this structure was finally determined high resolution in the early 2000s by Rog Kornberg at Stanford. It's quite fun because I was a postdoc in this department in a different lab at the time. And of course, in around the two, that year 2000, they were all working so hard in getting this structure. And it's a, it's a completely different way of looking at this while it's happening because people had no idea whether they would be succeeding. They had spent 20 years going after this structure. And nobody knew whether they would be successful. And of course, then they were. And coming back two, three years later, they were super famous for this. They were, in fact, so famous that they got the Nobel Prize for this structure, too. Um, so at this point, we now have this red RNA chain. So now we have the genetic information, but we've copied it from DNA to an RNA chain. But that's still just a sequence of bases. And now it's very fragile. So this is also fragile. This will break down spontaneously, as I mentioned, because RNA is not stable. Uh, there is a second process that does this. This RNA moves into a molecule called the ribosome. This is an old slide. It's a super old picture. It's old. It's 2005, four years after I got my PhD. Again, in the early 2000s, we had no idea what the ribosome looked like. So this ribosome, as I mentioned, is a complicated structure, both with pieces of RNA and protein and everything. So this takes the messenger RNA coming in, the small red chain there. And then they had this other piece of RNA, transfer RNA, that is kind of small carriers. And each such carrier has bound one amino acid. And then you just have a sequence of these carriers. We're getting more and more and more of them. And then the, what the ribosome does is that it then stitches all these amino acids together into a long chain. And that's how we create the protein. And there were a number of groups involved here, but in particular, Tom Stites, Peter Moore, and Venki Ramakrishna. Um, I got the Nobel Prize in 2009 for this, with X-ray structures. So we're talking about fairly modern science here. Again, it's only 15 years ago these structures were not available at all. So what you effectively do here is that you, have these, you have, always have triplets of bases. Each triplet of base will uniquely code for a particular amino acid. And it was originally Francis Crick who discovered that. And this concept was what we call the genetic code that I'm sure you've heard about, but you might not remember it. This table you need to know by heart. No. <laughs> you destroyed my joke. <laughs> no, you don't know it by heart. Uh, nobody. Actually, the sad part is that there are molecular biologists that know it by heart, but you're physicists. You're not going to know it by heart. Uh, completely useless knowledge to know by heart. So how many different ways? If you have four bases and you sit three of them together, how many different combinations can you have? 
That would require the molecular biologist to bring out the calculator, but you're physicists, so I expect you to be slightly better at that part. Four to the power of three, right? So four by four by four. That's 64. 64 combinations. Do you know from upper secondary school how many amino acids there are? 20. 20. That's not the same as 64. So they lied to you. There are 44 more. No. Um, so there are a couple of things, caveats here. First, we need to know when to stop. You need to know where to start, but that can actually be redundant with an amino acid. But the point, we need to start, we need to decide we need to decide when to no longer code. And there are actually three of these combinations that are stop codons. So when you see a stop codon, we assume this is the end of a protein, we're happy. But even then, there are 61 remaining. That does not mean that there are 41 amino acids you don't know of. So there's a built-in redundancy in the genetic code here. And this is also a classical exam question. Uh, if you look at the amino acids, I'm not sure whether you can see the table here or in your do you see that some amino acids are more common than others, right? Some amino acids, there are at least four, di there are four five, six different combinations that code for arginine, while the poor tryptophan is pretty much just one combination, right? So which amino acid do you expect to see more of in cells, tryptophan or arginine? So this, and how, if you just were to measure it, would you expect to see, do you think that you see six times more arginine than tryptophan? Yes. You do. Again, within the normal 10 or 15% variation. This is what explains the relative abundance. That is, i.e., how much we have of each amino acid. Not the evolution or anything. It's all based on physics, mathematics, combinatorics, whatever you call it, simple code. These are the building blocks that we can combine them in different ways, but we can't change the building blocks. Yes? That's probably what DNA has done over 4.3 billion years. So that now, of course, we're talking about in general, right? In your entire genome, not in a, spe a specific protein might there are, of course, some specific proteins that might not have any arginines, uh, membrane proteins, for instance. But these are the general, let's compare this with Lego, uh, the relative distribution of all Lego pieces that are being produced by Lego Inc. That's one thing. The Lego pieces I use for a particular, when I'm building a particular toy, that's a different matter. But those are the pieces, the building blocks that are available, and the relative abundance of them in nature is determined by the genetic code. Uh, and again, Francis Crick discovery. So to go from there, once we know what these building blocks are, right? And this was discovered in the 1950s. The other obvious thing is that, can't we just determine the structures of pro these proteins with X-ray crystallography? Because we know that there should be a unique structure. Again, sequence leads to structure, leads to function. If the structure is not unique, it's not gonna have a unique function. So there has to be a well-defined structure that only depends on these building blocks. So if I just know the sequence of the DNA, I can translate that using this code to the sequence of the amino acids in the protein. And then I should be able to determine, if I have 100 amino acids, I just need to decide, find a way to determine what the protein looks like. And that seems like such an obvious problem. And people started that, they actually started that in parallel with the discoveries of DNA. And one of the big heroes in this field was Max Perutz. It took them 22 years to determine the structure of hemoglobin. Again, in hindsight, it was worth it. Can you imagine starting a project now that you would finish when you're my, when my age? And you're not sure it's going to work. Talk about pouring your passion into something, right? Again, today it's simple because we know that yeah, there have been 5,000 other people in the world that have determined structures. Easy for me to do one. But being the first one, that is what real science is about. The other thing that we are so horribly spoiled with our computers, this is how they were determining their structure. They were sitting with rulers and measuring the distances between every single atom and building them up manually. Uh, 
there were other, in particular, um, hemoglobin. There's another protein called myoglobin that was determined in parallel. We will come back to what those differences are. Since then, there have been a number of structures determined. Um, my, uh, they got the Nobel Prize for the first structures, of course. Ion channels, these structures, when I was a PhD student, uh, the first ion channel structure appeared by Rod McKinnon. I remember that was a small, was a small uh, talk uh, out at Karolinska when the guy came over and presented his uh, structure. And people weren't really, I, I and some other people went because I was a bit interested in membrane proteins. And it was so embarrassing because nobody wanted to go out and have dinner with the guy. So that the, uh, the host there uh, convinced me and another colleague that can't you join us for the pizzeria. It's a bit embarrassing otherwise. So we were four people sitting around the table. Uh, three years later, of course, he got the Nobel Prize. And now there tend to be slightly more people who want to meet him when he's in Stockholm. Um, these are the structures that you have in, uh, actually this is not human shape, but these are more similar to the proteins that exist in humans where you actually have ion channels controlled by voltage. Aquaporins, these are the water channels that determine how much water goes in and out of your cells. Peter Rager shared the Nobel Prize with Rod McKinnon in actually not 2001, 2003. GPCRs, the ones I talk about, Brian Kobilka, also Stanford, got the Nobel Prize for those structures in 2012. And the way, the way virtually all of these structures have been determined is through X-ray crystallography. And that's what I said. Just take your proteins, grind it into a powder. So powder just means you will still have crystals, but they're going to be randomly oriented crystals. And then you put them in a very small droplet. We're talking about a microgram of crystal or something. And then you use a very large facility like the, uh, this MAX4 down in Lund, a synchrotron. So you're using light, uh, sorry, you're using, uh, not light, uh, you're having electrons rotate around in the ring. And then when you for use magnets to force the electrons to accelerate, so you're changing the direction, then they're going to uh, cause synchro synchrotron radiation lights. So you get very high intensity X-ray pulses. And then you use that and collect the scattered rays. That is so not film today, of course. You have computer CCD sensors. And then you're able to determine that type of patterns. It takes, it's slightly faster than 22 years nowadays because we have computers to help us. But then we determine what is the electron density corresponding to that pattern, and then you use computers to build a molecular model. But this can easily be a product that takes a few years. Just getting a crystal can take a year, if you can get it at all. But still, for a very long time, the safest way to get a Nobel Prize in chemistry was to determine the structure of a new important building block in your cells. And there are probably still more in the pipeline that it's a bit sad. When I first gave this course, I had all these uh, GPCRs. So you could say, oh, this is likely a future Nobel Prize. And that was so cool where I could say the next course round, and this was awarded the Nobel Prize last year. So a few years ago, um, there are other ways to determine structures, but historically nothing has come close to extra crystallography. And this is the beautiful way when uh, things change in science. They change much faster in biophysics than in traditional physics. There is another way called cryo-electron microscopy. I have a paper on this that I'm going to pass around to, if you're interested. Three pages, but the first page is just an image. Uh, in, and this is a 2015 paper in Nature. So cryo-electron microscopy builds on the fact that you all, you've heard about uh, or seen electron microscope pictures, right? And the whole idea is replace the light with electrons. If you just accelerate electrons to a few hundred thousand electron volts, they will have very short wavelengths, and then you can image with electrons. That is amazing in material science. You can literally see almost individual atoms and everything. So that way you can see structures that are as tiny as you want. The problem with that is that you only see that if you throw a lot of energy. You need to throw tons of electrons on this. And these proteins are fragile. So if you start to throw lots of electrons on a protein, it will break. And then you don't see the structure anymore. So you need to have very, very low doses of electrons. And they need very sensitive detectors. The only problem if you're shining electrons on those detectors, the detector breaks. Most things don't like 500,000 electron volt electrons being shot at them. So for a year, they, everybody was joking about calling these field blobology and everything because you got these faint outlines roughly of the shape of the structure. But then through a sequence of events, suddenly there was a generation of new better detectors. The microscope were better. So during two or three years, this was literally like turning a page. Uh, so suddenly the method was good enough. So today, the hottest technique in the field, and we have two high-end microscopes of this out at SciLife Lab, is that instead of collecting diffraction patterns, you have a very, very thin film of frozen protein sample, maybe just 100 nanometers thick or something. And then we're literally using a microscope. Well, it's an electron, and then we have a real sensor here. 
and then we're collecting images about these proteins from, say, 100,000 different directions. Now you have slice through images of your protein from 100,000 random directions. And that you throw in a computer and uh, tell the computer, please fix this. And the amazing thing that it works. <laughs> Um, we're gonna, well, no, I don't think I'm going to cover it that much, but it's an example, right? How modern experiments would not be possible without computers. And you can imagine the amount of physics and math that have gone into these reconstruction algorithms. So modern biophysics is in many ways more computational and mathematical than it is experimental. So there are some very cool proteins like that. On the, up on the left here, that was the structure. It's a TRPV1 protein. I'm not even going to go through the details of what it does. But up, up on the left there, that gray outline was how well you know the structures in the blobology days. We couldn't tell anything. And then Yi Fan Sheng, uh, a few years ago, they were able to get 3.4 angstrom structures. Do you see all the detail? You can see the individual helices and everything. And we're going to go through these components and structures on Friday. Uh, we can find the binding sites. We can understand what these molecules do. And in particular, these molecules, they're actually pain and heat receptors. Um, so if you're eating chili peppers, this molecule, capsaicin, binds to this channel and causes the channel to open. And that is how you sense pain or heat. And there, of course, there are hundreds of structures like this. Virtually every issue of Nature Now now has one or two high impact papers with a new structure determined by cryoelectron microscopy. So the unifying factor with all these things is that by having the right sequence of DNA or a particular sequence, we can build a chain. Actually, in some cases, in this place, is for different chains, but that's a complication we can go back to later. We can build a chain of amino acids. This particular sequence of amino acids will magically, for now, form some sort of structure. And what I'm going to argue, but that I can't prove to you yet, that process is based entirely on physics. And you might think that duh, that's obvious, but it's not at all obvious. When people started studying this 60, 70 years ago, they went, oh, maybe the cell has some sort of very special machinery for building all these proteins. But the fascinating thing that the entire structure, the way that this protein always finds the same state is based entirely on physics, which is remarkably cool. But once it has that particular structure, that was it creates the specific binding site here that causes us to bind that molecule. The way the entire molecule looks, it's what gives us the properties. If it's binding that molecule in the right place, the binding of that molecule will change the state the entire ion channel would like to be in. So suddenly when we have bound this small capsaicin molecule, suddenly it's better for the molecule to move over to another state where it's open. Then, about say a minute later, but probably a fraction of a second later, this molecule unbinds. And now it's better for the molecule to move back to the closed state again. So uh, these are stupid molecules. They're, they're literally just molecules, right? But because they can visit, they, they're large, they're way more complex than, say, water or carbon dioxide. They can exist in multiple different states. They will literally move. And that's a complication, because how do you see those motions in X-ray crystallography? We can't, right? You could imagine determining two structures. You could, first, we determine a structure of just the protein. And then I can take my crystal, but before I make the crystal, I can soak the crystal. I can add lots of this molecule, and I hope that this molecule will be bound everywhere in the crystal. And if I'm really lucky, I might hope maybe I can see one structure with the molecule and one without it. But how do we actually see the process when it's moving? So historically, the answer is you can't. Um, and this is where the modeling comes in, understanding the differences between different states, and where virtually all modern pharmacology and everything is after, because you can imagine that if all these molecules steer and control your nervous system, what if we could deliberately steer them? What if we could create the molecule that's a better anesthetic or something? But that will literally require us to be able to go in and fiddle around with the process a little bit. So what I'm going to talk about on Friday, sorry, the reason for this diversity is this polypeptide sequence. And polypeptide, I spoke about amino acids. That, sorry, there, there are lots of different names here. And some of these things will just slip out of my mouth. Um, a peptide string is just a sequence of amino acids. And the, why, the reason why I call it the polypeptide, I'm going to come back to this, is that, is that these amino acids, they tend to, they polymerize through something called peptide bonds. So each amino acid ends with a COO minus group, and then the next amino acid typically starts with an NH2 plus group. Sorry, NH3 plus. If they move together, and I think we have, yes, I have an example of this. So sorry, I have these two amino acids. 
If they move together, they can release a water and instead form a larger molecule that sits together. So you have one amino acid there and one amino acid there. And if this happens again and again and again, this is what's happened in the ribosome, then I create a very long chain of amino acids. So the point is that there are only 20 amino acids, but if I now have a string of, say, 10 of these, there are now 20 to the power of 10 different combinations. And that starts to be fairly large numbers. So by folding this, sorry, by connecting them in specific strings, I get much larger diversity. But just the string is not enough. Um, the string just means that I have a string of amino acids. What tells different proteins apart is that there are groups that I had on the other slide. Again, that's literally what makes one amino acid different from the other. Uh, so you have a tyrosine there in the middle, you have an alanine there, and you have a glycine there. So different side chains, the ones in red here, will cause a diversity. And we will come back to this too in the course, that this whole polymerization process is fairly simple. You deal with polymers in everyday life. Plastic. Plastic is just polymers. Poly the ethylene is a small molecule derived from ethanol. The ethylene, you might have heard of it, polyethylene, PE plastics, every single shopping bag. But those are fairly boring, right? But the reason why they're boring is that every single monomer is the same. It's just billions and trillions of copies of the same monomer. For amino acids, you can have different monomers. And because they're different, we get much greater specificity and much cooler molecules. But fundamentally, a whole lot of things are going to be kind of, from the physics point of view, part of this is similar to plastic. When it comes to sequencing, it was Fred Sanger in 1952 who uh, proved that, well, argued that proteins have a unique sequence, he managed to sequence it. There is a paper on Sanger's first paper on sequencing that he got the Nobel Prize for in Canvas, if you want to read it. It's a bit more chemical, so I didn't include it in the things I hand out, and I'm not going to cover it in detail. But given how, at SciLife Lab, we, we sequenced the roughly the equivalent of one human genome per day nowadays. The first human genome was a worldwide endeavor that took 10 years, and so now we do it in one day at one site. And Fred Sanger sequenced insulin, and it probably took him three or four years. So there's no other method that creates more biological information today than sequencing. It's exceptionally powerful. Um, these are old structures, beginning of the 1900s. So the fascinating thing, the people, all this research on the proteins on the one hand, protein sequence on the second, DNA structure and DNA sequence, funny, they all happen in parallel. And it wasn't really until the mid-50s or early 1960s that we realized that all these things stick together. Uh, good, I'm like, Jesus, for once, I'm on time. Ah. Um, so I mentioned that the DNA structure was arguably the world's greatest discovery of the 19th, uh, 20th century. Do you remember from the slides when the Watson and Crick paper showed up? When was it published? You have the paper in front of you. 52. When did I get the Nobel Prize? It took over a decade. So how on earth could it be that it took a decade toward the greatest invention, well, arguably the greatest discovery of the century, a Nobel Prize? So that. At the time, we didn't know because the Nobel Committee, their deliberations are secret. They're secret for 50 years. So about a decade ago, this was lifted, uh, six years ago, it was lifted and people said, so they were not even nominated until the early 1960s. Nobody understood how important the DNA structure would be. And there's this fallacy, we always, we tend to look at the future, but we think the future will look like the past, right? Science is obvious when you look at the rearview mirror, but in 1958, nobody could imagine that DNA would be important. It was just another small molecule that could be useful. Small fun paper, they determined the structure of a specific salt. Might or might not be important. And be aware of this, that it's the challenge with research, it's hard to predict, it's hard to make predictions in particular about the future. Uh, and today it's completely absurd that nobody bothered nominating them. Uh, it was Sir Lawrence Bragg who nominated them. We hope you have enjoyed this video and for more videos go to freakphysics.com.